There we go. So this is the risk working group meeting for February 18th, 2021. And today on the agenda is a review of some of the things that we talked about over the last several weeks, which is what what is the essentially it boils down to, I think, the minimum viable product and metrics for the risk working group. And uh, there's a couple of detailed summaries listed in the agenda. I won't spend any time um, walking us through that. I think everyone is either familiar with these or has um, uh, yeah, be probably familiar in general with what they say. I, I thought what I might lead with is just a summary of some of the conversations that I've, I've had with different people and email exchanges, and then just sort of looking at some of our notes from the past. I built this little spreadsheet with two tabs, needs and motivations, as well as resources and links. And the driving question, I think, we're ax what actional, I don't know what actional is, what, what, what metrics can we provide that would be useful? And a few things came uh, to the surface as possibly useful, enumerating vulnerabilities associated with particular packages. Um, NIST has a vulnerability database. Um, low hanging fruit might be something based on lib years. Um, this is a summary of some of the groups and communities that we've identified as stakeholders. And uh, some of the questions I pulled from our previous notes that seemed to rise to the surface a lot were, you know, if, if I have five ecosystems, what are their relative importance? Security vulnerability assessments. How do I know a component will continue to be available? And then of course, legal and compliance concerns. And then the second tab, there's a host of available resources um, at our disposal, um, including the um, OSF's, OSSF working group. Um, so this is this is still a lot to to take in and and digest. So I I thought maybe uh, you know reviewing that briefly, and then asking the questions of, um, you know, really where do we get involved? Um, and what are the tools that we leverage and what are some of the possible MVPs? So I've just kind of scanned the agenda here. Um, some of the possible minimum viable product metrics that I think emerged were things like enumerating the upstream dependencies for a particular project um, and then maybe using Libiers as a way of expressing risk associated with those dependencies and possibly enumerating known vulnerabilities within upstream dependencies. With that introduction of the summary, uh, I'll throw it open to comments, thoughts, direction from y'all. And also, of course, identification of what I may have missed. I realize this is a lot to take in. I, I, although you already know about it, uh, I'll just add <laughs> CI best practices badge data. Because of course that's got an API, and, you know, happy to help. If, any, if, if you want to extract data from it and you're having problems, just let me know. I will do what I can to help you out. Does the does the badge include um, dependencies? No, it does not. Uh, but um, it, well, eh. it includes uh, data that you can use to help you identify some uh, dependencies, um, and it talks about you know you, what what do you do when you bring in dependencies? But uh, I. Are we only going to be talking about dependencies today? I mean, okay, that's fine. I think, I, well, I think dependence, dependencies and vulnerabilities seem to coexist and have a close relationship with each other. I think sure. the risk of uh, dependencies are a concern because they represent risk really from a couple of perspectives. One is the ongoing likelihood of that 
dependency being sustained and the other is are there known vulnerabilities in a dependency um, that my project has I, I think just continuing an earlier conversation we've had though you know how do you, you know, I, I want to I'm thinking about bringing something is a de, as a dependency how do I evaluate one thing that we've been encouraging people to do is hey does it already have a badge yeah okay um so you can evaluate dependencies in that sense of what do they you know, are, are, are they badged already which is something you can easily determine I may have missed this but what is a badge in this context oh okay this is the ci best practices badge um i will okay, uh, basically uh the ci best practices uh badge project identifies a set of criteria that are believed to be um you know good for security and if you meet those criteria congratulations you get a badge there's three badge levels passing silver gold uh and i will gladly slip in there a link to uh, more about this but we i lead this particular project so i knew something about it uh and we've got over three thousand projects participating our linux kernel and you know, just lots and lots of folks are participating i'm going to put in the link without the language because actually we support multiple languages if you click on it and your preferred language is english that's what you'll see thank you You know, since I'm doing, I will also slip in a link for the uh, project stats so you can get an idea of growth of participation over time. Uh, David, are, are, the, are the CII badges um, self-certified or are they analyzed and endorsed? Yes. <laughs> so it's much more self-certified. Uh, however, where we can, we, uh, we, we do have automation that both fills in the answer for you and rejects the human answer if we can show it's false. So uh, if a human says, I do version control and there's no repo, <coughs> you get a no. Show me the repo. <laughs> you don't have to use GitHub, but show me something. Right, so so it sounds like it's, it's useful if a person is looking at it but might not be a reliable indicator if you're uh, if you're trying to do it programmatically um what we what i'm not sure i understand your statement let, 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 let me let me give let me let me say that a little bit differently given a list of dependencies yes um if a bunch of them say yes they have a cii badge what yes. we know is that they have self-certified at the very least that they have a cii badge right but that doesn't necessarily mean they're programmatically applying all the best practices. Like we, it's not verifiable. Right, that, that's right. Because some of them, for example, one says that your homepage has to describe clearly what your project does. I know of no way to uh, do that purely via automation. Now, all their answers must be public. And if they falsify them, we, over, we will over. You know, we, we depend on reports, people report back. I uh, usually just tell them, hey, go fix your problem. That's not really adequate. Uh, but if they, if it turns out they're generally falsifying, uh, they get kicked off. I can, uh... we haven't had that problem, by the way. The main problem that we've had is not so much people falsifying data. The main problem we've had is uh, SEO scammers. But I can say, Dwayne, from I got Augur. I went I went through the CII best practices badge for Augur, and I, I think the utility that it served for our project was it forced us to think about things that we may we hadn't done yet, and it became a way of saying, okay, yes, we should do this, and we should do that. So it it did inject reflection and improvement to the project just by going through the process. Um, Obviously, you're right. It, it can't prove that all of your assertions are correct. Right. But it's, I, I, it was a good exercise. I feel like we have a, a sounder open source project for having gone through the process. I want to let me let me be clear. I'm not calling into question the value of the CI. Yeah, I, and I didn't. I just wanted to make sure right. that I understood. Is yeah. it is it self certification or is it something that we can rely on sort of deterministically. And I, I get, I, I understand the difference and the difference. Right, in the difference right. Now. Yeah, so the badge tries to do a little bit deterministic, 
but we focused more on what was important, whether or not it was deterministic. If you want deterministic, uh, the OSSF scorecard, which is already listed here, they focus purely on what can we measure. Um, yeah, I was looking at that just now too. I, I don't want to pull us out off of the main discussion though, so I just had a passing question. Yeah, I, I, unsurprisingly, both approaches have pros and cons. <laughs> But I, I don't think we necessarily have to provide the full end-to-end -end thing, but I, I think the recommendation is when you flag all your dependencies, find a way to qualify them or rate them in some measure. And these are mechanisms that you can apply against that list that can either tell you which ones have or don't have badges or have a rating given these other tools that you've presented. So I don't necessarily think that we have to to spell it out explicitly, just the recommendation is having something that can qualify the kinds of dependencies or qualify their validity, quality, security, or whatever dimensions that we're including. So I, I generally like that approach. Um, I don't know how comprehensive these sets are. So if we recommend something and then only half of the dependencies have a badge or are even recognized in that system, then you have to have something that's more piecemeal. Well, I, I will say that you know the good news is, for example, specifically the badge, 3,000 projects is a whole lot of projects. The bad news is that there are literally millions of open source projects. <laughs> so, you know, I, I I don't, you know, it, it very much depends on what your what your criteria are for for trying to do the measurement. I, I think for the badges, we have we we certainly have never said require the badge or never use the dependency. I think that's not a reasonable position. But I think it is reasonable. Hey, see if they have a badge that tells you that they're at least claiming to do a lot of things. We verified some things are being done, um, and uh, you know that should reduce your risks. I agree. So, so I um, there's a, there's a number of so. There's a number of tools that, that already do these things. And I don't think that chaos's software infrastructure needs to go recreate those wheels, but we could define formal metrics that, that are chaos metrics that use those tools as implementations of the metric. Um, and in some of the, dis so from discussions with many of you, these ones at the bottom are, I guess I would call them ideas like the first idea about like you know getting to action uh, the minimal viable product for for metrics that we can build and i guess I, I would like to maybe ask if we take a minute to to look at these talk about them see see which i see and i see a progression from a to b to c so simply enumerating the dependencies is a step and then uh, counting the lib years for a project's upstream dependencies is sort of a second step that built on the first one. And enumerating known vulnerabilities for those dependencies might be a third step. So maybe they are three different metrics, but they build, build on each other. And then the one I added is the, uh, you know, OSF scorecard actually looks like a pretty, you know, looks like a pretty easy piece of software to implement. Um, and and we may choose to build a, a metric that just simply reflects what that tool does. So so one thing would be did I did I capture things that we all th that many of you, that any of you think are potential MVPs or have I completely missed a bunch of stuff or misconstrued conversations. <clears throat> I, I just added the uh, security, uh, met the security bash dashboard stuff uh, where you know, they're, they're starting to build out a, a, a tool to show off various kinds of numbers. But of course, now the problem is, well, what do we show? <laughs> right. And what they're currently showing is the scorecard and the CI best practices badge and um, 
and some GitHub data, basically, you know, and, and some GitHub data, like the number of committers. Yeah, that was that was just going to be the area that I was thinking about. So, I, in terms of other sort of attribute metrics on top of dependency metrics, you're talking about number of overall dependencies, any sort of age of that dependency from libvir, vulnerabilities attached to the dependency, and then or other potential security ratings on each dependency. It doesn't mention sort of the overall project sustainability which isn't necessarily an agreed upon metric but the this thing is still being supported or has some someone at least who's an active maintainer versus if this gets wildly out of date now no one will work on it anymore so some some kind of metric that dates the longer term sustainability of it and i know that's a whole can of worms unto itself so maybe pointing to something out of maybe the common working group. I was just thinking if we could point to another reference metric that might already be in chaos that we think is the most appropriate, at least for an initial recommendation, but you could say track more depending on what's important to you. Thank you for putting language around the thing I was trying to get language around, Sophia, because I, I, I also have a similar concern here that I'd love to see something in here that points to um uh how active is is the project now right and when when tidelift wrote their unmaintained dependency scanner they they focused in on on two key things and one of them was is the code still changing and if there are new issues are they closing at or about the same rate as they're coming in right at or better than the rate that they're coming in so if we see there's no code change and issues are piling up over time, it's a good indicator that that library is probably not being maintained anymore. Um, and if we see, if we see that issues are starting to come in faster than they're being closed, once you get past that initial growth or maybe an initial release, if that's the trend over time, that's a good indicator that the maintainer is underwater and that it's at risk. Um, there's three or four different metrics in the chaos group that point to these. Um, uh i have them open in another doc because i had to pull them together for a proposal on how we might meet sys controls for for open source library management so yeah I, i'm actually somewhat skeptical of the issue count closing because uh the reality is that the number of things that somebody wants somewhere is infinite and uh, i certainly don't you know, I, I will say that uh you know we often don't want to kill good ideas even if we're not going to work on them right now um, so I usually leave issues on and just let them hang. I will close them if, we're, if they're done or if we're not going to do them. But the number of commits being made, I think usually is a really good indicator. And if, if no changes are being made, there's a rare program which doesn't change. There are such programs, by the way, in the JavaScript world, but they're kind would, of unusual and you can detect them by size. Would, would you say that the trends by project could be an indicator that takes into account your concern. So, if the if the issues are start to start to close at a significantly lower rate compared with their historical averages, even given that you want to keep some open for long term concerns, I, I'm, I'm actually still skeptical. What that okay. means is that more people are interested. <laughs> but the but the number of things that somebody wants is infinite. There there's an uh. There, uh, uh Human needs are uh, an, an, an infinite resource. Eh? <laughs> Somebody wants something. But uh, so I would focus more on the commits being made. Uh, but but I, I, we do have examples within the Java library ecosystem of something that's done stable. And if there's not a CVE, there's not going to be a change in it. Right. And that's OK. Uh, but they tend to be the small ones, too, like is odd. Um, that's probably not going to change unless they change the Java spec, which has happened, but not very often. Yeah, that is true. I mean, there's always the case where it doesn't the project doesn't necessarily need to be super active to be functional. Um, I'm just sort of thinking, connecting all these pieces together, say something is flagged and there is a known vulnerability in a project, 
and there's no one supporting it, then it's likely that it'll never get fixed. So right. in terms of how all these, I guess the, the thing that I'm most interested in is not necessarily con like activity is a marker that there are people that are still vested in. Right. So I think that's more, the key. Is there evidence that it's that it's still active? Yeah. And so maybe it's like, I'm thinking about, I know the Trudy called it like the onion analysis. I don't know where that came from. But in terms of, say, the committers that are responsible for the bulk of the activity versus a bunch of people that might just be coming in and out and are less, more temporal. So, I, I mean, maybe that's a little bit too sophisticated for something like this, but something that could definitively show that the project is still being supported by a group of people that are invested in it, not just people coming in, committing one thing, leaving, and that isn't necessarily a sign that the project is, is healthy or being sustained. So some indicator of a sustained contributor core that doesn't, it doesn't change. I mean, it will change over time, but just that right. there is at least one person there who's interested in keeping the thing alive. <laughs> I will think about what that metric is. I don't know if I have a good one. I know we've debated them internally as well as externally. I just added that as a note under the sustainability risk. Mm -hmm. So if you know. So would this be a of these this so we've kind of got a list now of six things if f is the sixth letter of the alphabet which i think it is um <laughs> uh is, would this represent pos I'm, I'm trying to sort of rearrange and put things in the order of that we should do them or that we would kind of want to do them does this order look right are there things that we should move around um I would propose we should bring or make a title as a atomic metric and add it to the list and maybe start taking one and discussing them as a formalizing. In this way, we'll be approaching. I, I love this discussion and it is like way like giving me a lot of knowledge, but like producing some artifact uh, in terms of metric, we should pick one and like maybe have a heading or a title for that and put it in the Excel sheet and we start writing on that. Yeah, I agree. Um, or several, I, I would say several. And and yes. so the, 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 the question I was really asking, so I'm looking at four in this agenda as this sort of, we've developed a to-do list. These are the things we're gonna build out. And mostly I was asking if the priority was approximately right or the, not that they can't be worked on in parallel, but to give us some focus, um, does this look like approximately the right order? Is there, or is there anything that um, is dramatically wrong? Because it, given this order, we'd start to look at the dependency enumeration, which I believe we we started last week for upstream, um, the projects that my project depends on. And we could pivot over to continuing to work on that metric. So to make sure I understand your question is, is it is this an order of operations or an order of level of relative importance? Uh, relative importance, I, I think, um, although there is implicit dependency, <laughs> not, to, not to be punny, but you know, you have to enumerate your dependencies so you can examine their dis, uh, sustainability risk and, um, live years and vulnerabilities. So yeah, like there's, you kind of have to do, I think we have to do A first yeah. and then B through F are, they could be negotiable. So do we wanna look at the, um, I think the first one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we had started this um, in our last meeting so um, we could continue with with essentially this um, language level upstream dependency account uh, count, which seems like a long name. We might evaluate that, but it's basically 
the repository, repository dependency enumeration task or list is I think what this is and um, any of does it it seems to me like it might be the right thing to just start maybe spend 10 minutes working on this metric and then trying to develop it John can you share the link Oh of yes, this. of course, of course. Yeah, that's a good idea. It is. It is in the notes, but that's not super helpful because there's a lot of things in the notes. <laughs> Thank you. Does, does everyone think this is a good uh, piece of work to start using this time for? Sure. All right. So, um, I don't like the name, but I'll leave it alone for now. So, um, generally what we do is we spend maybe 10 minutes working on something and then check back with each other. Um, I'm going to pause the recording because it doesn't really make for brilliant entertainment and rewatching to see us work for 10 minutes. I'm going to resume recording. This is a good discussion. Um, you know, if, if you're trying to answer the question, are, do I have any vulnerable components? You definitely need to consider all of them. Yeah. Well, it's also like the case where if you say have five unique dependencies on one same thing, like five different pieces rely on that one. Right. They counted as one. Connection, then I would say that that's relatively more important to know. Um, as in like just saying that that's one dependency, I don't necessarily think captures the fact that if that dependency breaks, now five things break, not just one thing in your application. So would it be, maybe be a parameter for how many, how many files or files being? How many packages? Uh, how many packages how many? depend on this package kind of thing? Yeah, or a, a way to like have volume within each enumeration. And maybe that's getting too complicated. And I'm also wondering how many of these tools would report it that way versus just recognizing that it's there versus recognizing that it's there five times. Yeah, you know, most of the tools that I'm aware of, you can walk through and find that, walk, but you have to walk the tree yourself. They're just gonna give you a list. And I, I think the problem here is I've seen several folks trying to measure that thing that they're trying to measure Sevilla. Um, and it is it is challenging. Just measuring counts actually doesn't do the job, because it may be depending on a very very tiny piece. It may be depending on only because there's an option that might use it, and you never use that option. Um, there has been some work to measure at runtime how often it goes into a, ver a certain library to measure importance, and even that's kind of dubious because that depends on the inputs. Um, Sometimes the error handling systems only get hit in incredibly rare circumstances, but the only reason you're using it is because it can handle the special circumstances. So it's it's just a mess to, to handle. Uh, I, I think right now it would be better to be simple. <laughs> Here, how many are, wait, which ones are you depending on and go? <laughs> the, the, the thing you're pointing at is valid though. You know, there, there's a difference between um, this, you know, we we call is odd in in this one library and you know these five completely different parts of the application all really heavily depend on this single dependency right like the, those those two dependencies even though it's one dependency each the latter one has a larger impact if it if it suddenly becomes vulnerable or or, or causes problems so maybe yeah, it all depends. And of course, it all, from a security point of view, it does. It depends on your threat model. If you're worried about malicious developers, I don't care how many uh, times it's ever used. If it enters my system at all, I'm now worried. So. I, we we could maybe mark this as a thing to come back to because yeah. I think it, I think it's worth seeing if we can refine it once we get um, further into the process. Um, you know, we could start here and then come back to looking at. Uh, that particular aspect of the question. Yeah, I mean, it also potentially that could be one of the the sub characteristics too. So if the if this is just the enumeration of all your dependencies, and then the other qualities that we would attach that are the the vulnerability report, the number of times it's occurring in your system, and things like that, that could be the dimensionality of of that. So I'm I, I'm fine with it being an add on. 
and not part of this sort of core definition. And when you say it, I've been tracking lots of sub conversations you refer to. Uh, what's the best way to call it? Um, number of occurrences of a single. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. But maybe it would go like I think in this it would actually go in the other document we were working on um, in terms of all of the dimensions you would want to add to dependencies. That's a good point. I guess I could do that too versus making you type all the notes, Sean. No, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know how to put it into words, so maybe you should right. type it, Sophia. I opened up under C in the notes. I, I'm, I'm struggling for exactly there. Because it's like, it really, we're, you're trying to get at how dependent is a project on this library. And one of the ways of getting at that is how often is it used in different files and maybe how often it's used at runtime. And maybe those are two different things that we have to define. I tried to put in a little text in the Google Doc uh, under under parameters. Uh, I mean, feel free to move whatever. Just trying to capture something about the discussion we just had. I would be unsurprised if we start simple, but trying to capture <laughs> all this. Sophia, if, uh, feel free to fix up what I typed in there. I, I don't know if I captured exactly what you had in mind okay wait which file is that in <laughs> uh it's the google it's, doc um it's in the metric um, definition doc we were working on yeah under parameters throw it in the right, chat. I'm, on, I'm on two different machines so that's certainly not oh <laughs> <laughs> nah. all right power two different windows is not enough yeah <laughs> zoom doesn't work on my work laptop but it's nice that i can see all of my screen still and still be productive Ah. Some sometime when life returns to places where we have coffees and adult beverages, I'd love to hear the story about why Zoom doesn't work on your Google laptop. <laughs> Even better, ask me the time that I tried to install it to be an ATO host and what happened afterward. <laughs> well, I recommend uh, going to get that coffee or whatever no matter what <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they'll well it would be nice to see all of you <laughs> yeah likewise um we've got about a minute and a half left in our allotted time uh i think really good work today uh fleshing out this metric i think it's uh moving very quickly towards something that we can propose and you know i would encourage everyone you know if you have a chance to look at um the list of other metrics that we laid out that kind of occur in sequence for next time and because uh, i think we'll be able to finish a draft of this metric the next time and perhaps move on to uh, a second metric um, and then maybe some of us can start experimenting with the tools that exist to do these things and maybe even test the metrics or evaluate them against what's actually available um, so any other thoughts or things that folks want to share before we go? No, but I think the idea of next next time we need finish, try to uh, trying to wrap that up. Yep, I'll put that at the top of the agenda after we hang up for next time. All right, so. See everybody in two weeks. See everybody in two yeah. weeks. Take care. Thank you all. See y'all. Bye. Yeah.